Well, glory to God. Welcome once again to Power of Faith. I'm Pastor Philip Durp with your family of faith, Victor Church, right here in the capital city of Frankfort, Kentucky. And just delighted to be able to share with you in the truths of God's word once again. Luke 1 37 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And I just want to welcome you to this special edition of Power of Faith on this marvelous Monday. I have in the studio with me today a brother in the Lord, Pastor Jason Carter. Pastor Jason, welcome to Power of Faith. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate uh, it. We're going to have us a time this week. Yes, sir. All right. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, as a pastor yourself, you know the importance of uh, spreading the good news. Absolutely. Right? Yes, sir. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to really uh, get into some things this week, you know, and and encourage uh, those that are listening, uh, because God, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Yes. And there was a, there was a time in your life uh, that everything looked impossible. Absolutely. Tell me, uh, let's back let's back up the your your life. How was you raised? What kind of family was you raised in? Um, well, uh, if if I may, uh, sure. Pastor Philip, uh, let me. I just want to just express uh, what an honor it is mm. to be sitting here with you. Um, and and we'll get into my past, but one of the first encounters I ever had with a prophet or the prophetic was with you, Pastor Philip. And uh, every time you've ever spoken into my life, it's always come to pass mm. every time. Thank you. Thank you. First door that ever opened to me in Lexington to preach the gospel, you prophesied it and it come to pass two weeks later. Mm. So I just wanted to just share that and just encourage the listeners, uh, the importance of having men and women uh, that hear from God mm -hmm. and that speak into your life with accuracy and the, the diligence that we have when we hear those words, to hold on to them mm -hmm. and believe them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I was raised in a, a single parent home. Mm -hmm. My mother raised six of us. Oh, wow. I'm second to the youngest out of six of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my mother dropped out of school uh, in the eighth grade, pregnant with my oldest sister, Tina. We lived in the projects. We were on welfare. I have a different father than my brothers and sisters. And my father died when I was 10. Okay. Uh, but before that, I never, I may have seen him maybe five times. Mm -hmm. I can only remember him giving me something in my life two times mm. before he died. Um, of course, his side of the family, I, I knew my grandma, I knew my uncle growing up. They were a part of my life. He had other children by other women, grew up knowing those brothers and sisters. Uh, so um, it was a pretty good childhood. I, I mean, we weren't, uh, my mom never done drugs, has never been an alcoholic, never drank. We've never known our mom to Did do Did she that. take you to church? She took us to church. She would take us New Hope Baptist Church, and I hated every minute of it. <laughs> Sunday night, she would sit us in the floor and make us watch Fred Price Sr.'s mm -hmm. television program. Mm -hmm. Hated every second of it. Mm -hmm. We could be out shooting basketball or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, she did. She made us go to church. I took us to church when I was 15 years old. Uh, she got tired of making me go. The whoopings didn't hurt no more. Mm -hmm. So she just said, forget it. I'm not going to make you go anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, my mom, though, is my hero. Um, when I was 10, um, I got off the school bus. My mom's telling me that she's trying to explain to me that my father's in the hospital dying from Hodgkin's disease. Uh, when he was in Vietnam, he was exposed to Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's in the hospital dying, and she's asking me, do you want to go to the hospital and see him? And I said, well, he never came to see me while I was alive. I don't want to see him now that he's dying. Mm. So she didn't make me go. But that day, sitting on the porch that day, I'm sitting on the porch, my mom's sitting in the chair, and God spoke to my mom that day and told her, if you take the first step, I'll take you the rest of the way, and Jason's going to be my preacher. Mm. I never knew that. I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And what that meant for my mom was the very next day she went, got her GED. God took my mom through four years of college, got her degree from West Kentucky University as a social worker, and we moved out of the project. So needless mm -hmm. to say, our lives drastically changed after mom got her college degree. Yeah. So, you know, and we didn't have the best of things, but I can't remember a time her going to school 
where we were hungry or didn't have clothes on our back, food on the table, a roof over our head. And so I look back and I can see how God was supernaturally providing for my mom and us throughout. So you went from uh, uh, 10 years old to being a preacher. (laughs) Well, (laughs) 10 years old, 15 years old, I I stopped going to church. Um, Of course, mom and them continued. And my world was just I was consumed with basketball. Mm. I I felt in my heart that I was good enough. I planned on playing basketball for college. My life was just, everything was basketball. Like I said, we didn't do drugs and alcohol. Mom didn't do it in the house. Uh, Boyfriends that she would bring, she always shielded us from that. Was you good? I was pretty good. Mm -hmm. I was pretty doggone good. Uh, When I graduated high school, um, I actually uh, came to Kentucky State University. Okay. And this is where my life starts to kind of take a downward spiral. up here on campus, uh, crossing Main Street from Young Hall to Main Campus, mm-hmm. uh, I got hit by a car. What? It was, a, it was a, a Sunday evening. So Saturday morning, all of us freshmen and sophomores were playing ball down behind Young Hall. Mm-hmm. And the coach was out there. So he came, me and two other guys, and he asked us to come try out to be a walk-on. He had two spots. Mm-hmm. And so we were slated to try out that following Monday. Sunday evening, we decided to go shoot basketball in the gym instead of outside. And we had just gotten a letter. Every one of us in Young Hall had just gotten a letter from the president of the university saying, do not cross the four lane, use the tunnel. Well, none of us listened to her. We're crossing the street. There's a man in the truck with two big dogs in the back. And uh, he stops. Only vehicle on the road at the time. He stops. Some of the guys went around the front of the truck. Some went around the back. I went around the back. And uh, all I remember is my best friend at the time called my name, Jason. I turned around and looked. And when I turned around and looked at him, a Honda Prelude going about 35, 40 miles an hour hit me in my left leg, threw me 50 feet in the air, 50 feet from the street, uh, landed, hit the ground face first. Um, first person on the scene was a registered nurse that had just gotten off work. She comes, she tackles me, makes me lay down, and uh, I had fractures in my pelvis. All my muscles and ligaments in my legs were torn in two. Uh, Kind of messed up your tryout, didn't it? Messed up my tryout. Missed that opportunity, for sure. You know, uh, doctors were telling me I'd walk with a limp for the rest of my life, that I'd never have children. Uh, And I was okay with the no having children. I just, you know, I'm 18. I can't walk with no limp. I can't shoot ball no more. Mm. So my life was, you know, pretty, pretty devastated at the age of 18. Wow. Uh, Went back home. One of the high schools in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where I'm from, had an indoor swimming pool. They let me do hydrotherapy. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, I was back at Kentucky State University, able to dunk a basketball again. Wow. So I know God's hand was on my life. and and the circumstances of my life at that time, I hadn't gotten into drugs and alcohol, but I was having an affair with a married woman. Mm-hmm. We started sleeping together. I was 16. She was 26. Uh, a Marine brought her over from the Philippines. We started working together at White House. And just my mom kept telling me, you better leave that woman alone. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I thought God was trying to kill me I, when I had the wreck, when I got run over by the car. I thought God was trying to kill me for my sin. Mm-hmm. I didn't know God. Right, right. My concept of God was he's some great big angry ogre of a of a God with a long white beard and long white mustache, long white hair with a club in his hand ready to whack me every time right. I did something wrong. Right. And and I'll never forget uh when I come back, <laughs> they had an evangelist come to Kentucky State University to do a service and <clears throat> we're in the 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 service there. And uh my cousin <laughs> was a student too, we're the same age, Christina. And my friend, they made me go to this church service. And I didn't want to go because I thought God's trying to kill me. Mm-hmm. So I sit way up in the nosebleeds. Mm-hmm. And this evangelist is down there preaching. And he gives an altar call. And I kid you not. Everybody, because they knew I'm the guy that got run over by the car. Everybody turned around and looked at me, <laughs> waiting for me to come down there to give my life to Jesus. So the pressure of that moment, I walked down to the stage. Preacher man bends down in front of me and he says, young man, you come to give your life to Jesus? And I'm crying and I'm like, no, sir. And he said, what'd you come for? And my cousin said, well, he's the one that got ran over by the car a couple of weeks ago. And he goes, and you don't want to give your life to Jesus? And I said, no. He said, what'd you come down here for? I said, I want to ask you a question. He said, what? 
I said, why is God trying to kill me? Mm. And this is the first time I ever heard somebody say that God loves me. Mm. He said, young man, God's not the one trying to kill you. He's the one that kept you alive. He loves you. Mm -hmm. First time in my life I'd ever heard someone just say to me, God it's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So how did you, uh, our time is getting away from us today. Yeah. We'll pick it up again tomorrow. But how did you end up uh, uh, getting into the uh, deeper sin? Uh, back at K-State, I didn't know what it was at the time, uh, but I, I want to call it a depression. Hmm. I'm sitting in, in my dorm room. Uh, with the lights out, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not partying. I'm not doing anything. I'm just in this funk and yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, I don't know what's going on with me. And then my roommate came in one night. He'd been running around with some boys from Cleveland, Ohio and said, here, Jay, you need to try this. Mm -hmm. I said, what's it going to do? He said, it's going to make you laugh, mm -hmm. make you have joy again. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was marijuana. Mm -hmm. So first time I ever tried a drug was in the dorm room. At Kentucky State mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. And when I hit that joint for the first time, it was like going down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually got kicked out of school for having weed in my room. Mm -hmm. uh, went back home. Mama said I sent my son to go get a college education. I get kicked out for drugs. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't let me move back in with her. I mm -hmm. lived in my car for two months till I got my own place. Mm -hmm. And by that time, my older brother had gotten into selling crack cocaine. Okay, Crack cocaine was the drug of choice in those days. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm running along behind him. He's the one of the neighborhood dealers. I'm driving his cars, messing with his girls, and he's keeping me, trying his best to keep me away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but his best friend behind his back showed me cook crack, sell crack, everything that comes with that life. Uh, started playing with pistols and guns and stuff uh, and just, you know, end up going way deeper Started snorting cocaine at that time because mm -hmm. they told me you snort cocaine, you'll stay up mm -hmm. and get money. You know? Well, you got me on the edge of my seat right <laughs> now. And uh, our time has gotten away on this marvelous Monday. Those of you listening, uh, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And we only have so much time to uh, get into uh, Pastor Jason's Carter's testimony. We'll pick it up here tomorrow because when you see what God can do and you may be listening and got a call of God on your life or something or just want to see your life be successful, but you got something that is holding you down, call our prayer line 502-597-4356. And talk to our uh, prayer ministers. Uh, they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they can minister to you and uh, you can enjoy true freedom. Pastor Jason, thank you for being so candid today. I know we just got you uh, deep in, in trouble, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but we're going to get you out of that tomorrow. Yes, uh, but until then. Uh, this is Pastor Philip and Pastor Jason reminding you that Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. You be a blessing.